All right. You may be seated there. How's everybody doing? Come on, how's everybody doing? That song is anointed. I might sing it next Sunday. Not up here, though. It's good to be in the house of the Lord together, isn't it? It's good to be in church. The Bible says, let us be glad. Let us be glad. Not mad, not sad, not I was dragged. I was glad when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. How many are grateful for what God's doing in our church right now? Amen. Come on, can we just thank God? He's been good to us. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Corey. Corey is amazing, amazing, amazing. Put your hands together for Corey. Thank you, brother, for serving us. Twelve thirty. What's going on? Twelve thirty. What's going on? I'm I'm so excited to be back. My wife and I. Um, we took the Sunday off. We went to Cheesecake Factory. And why do I think even going to the Cheesecake that we're not going to bump into people from our church? So we're standing there in the morning, and a guy said, hey, Pastor Steve. I'm like, what are you doing here? And uh, he's a plumber, and uh, he was working on a business there. And, and then we went to the Cheesecake Factory, and a couple from our church had gone to the second service. And, and uh, so we bumped into them, and um, they said Pastor Andrew did an amazing job, which he always does. Come on, put your hands together and thank God for him. And... Then we left the Cheesecake Factory and I bounced into a couple other people. And so it just reminds me, I have to go to like Barstow or something. <clears throat> and, uh, but although uh, uh, we were not here, I, I'm so excited to be here. And when I miss a Sunday, I'm just like, I can't wait to get back. And the reason why we take time is because when you preach four times on a Sunday and you do that week after week after week, not only are you tired, uh, but the church is tired <laughs> of hearing me. Because I'm just like, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Andrew comes and he just, oh, you're awesome. And he puts his arms around you. Then I come back and yell and scream at you for a little bit. And you know what I'm talking about, parents? Like you, like you tell your kid the same thing over and over and over and they don't listen at all. Then like a relative says the same thing. And then they do it. And it's just a different voice. And so it's good to bring in a different voice. And he always does such an amazing job. And, uh, but I, I feel like an like a, like a athlete that hasn't gotten to play for a couple of weeks because he was injured and now he's back. And uh, so I'm ready to go, and uh, I'm so excited to be here. Are you ready to dive into the Word of God? All right. So I'm saving my best service for last. Here we go. All right. Grab your uh, copy of the Word of God and turn, would you, uh, to the book of Psalm. Uh, Psalms is the book, but Psalm 112. Psalm 112, okay? Did you bring your Bible to church? Yes. Psalm 112. i so excited today I kick off a brand new two-week series called What Really Matters. Would, would you say that with me out loud? What? Really say, it, say it like you really mean it. What? Really so did you find Psalm 112? Yes. All right. So hold your place there. And, and uh, here's the What really does matter? What really does matter? Do you know the most, two most important days of our life? Number one is our birthday. How many know that's a really special day? Come on. Your birthday was really special. I was born at March 4th, 1961. <laughs> March 4th, 1965, 53 years old. So that's an important day for me, and your birthday is just as important for you. Here's another day that's actually more important, not your B day. Here it is, your Y day. Your Y day is uh, October for me. I don't know exact date, but it was October 1985. I was born March 4th, 1965, but my Y day is more important than my B day. My birthday was to celebrate the day that I was born. My Y day is in October of 85. I discovered why I'm on the planet here. I'm not just living for me. I'm living for the glory of God. And uh, how many know that, that what really matters is that I'm here to use my talent, my treasure, my gifts to expand the kingdom of God. So my birthday is really important. My Y day is way more important. Can I hear an amen in the house? Let me remind you, I know I've only been gone a week, but uh, I preach way better when I get some feedback. So everybody say amen. 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 And you are dismissed. <laughs> Just kidding. So um, I, I was telling the other services, I, I love young people. Um, don't you love young people? 
I, we're, my wife and I are here every Wednesday night, not because anybody forces us to, not even because my kids ask us to be here. We choose to be here. We love being around young people. I guess because it makes us feel younger uh, now that I'm 53. I just, I love being here. And if you think, honestly, if you think the worship is good on Sunday morning, you should peek your head in, ask security to let you on Wednesday night because it's louder, it's uh, darker, it's more intense, it's powerful what takes place on Wednesday night. And anybody that comes on Wednesday night, can you give me an amen? Yeah. It's awesome. So we love hanging out here and uh, I love being here on Wednesday night. Here's what I've discovered about young people, though. Do you know they only have a concept really, well, I shouldn't say all of them, but a lot of young people only have a concept of today. They don't even consider tomorrow or next week or in a month. They're just like all focused on today. It's because they grew up in this instant gratification culture. True or false? And, and so, like, think about this. On the way to the soccer game or on the way to church, you can stop at McDonald's and you get an entire meal for the entire family in less than five minutes. I want it now. When I was a kid, we didn't even have microwaves. Let me say it again, and I want to get a little like, oh. Let me rewind the tape. We didn't even have microwaves back then. And, and how many remember that? You did, we didn't have a microwave. Okay, and uh, now it's just like you get a whole meal, Swanson dinner in three or four minutes, and uh, it's crazy, isn't it? How many of you like Pop-Tarts? Let me see your hand. Pop-Tarts, don't raise your hand. Those are so bad for you. I know, you can start in January, but... Uh, Next time you get some Pop-Tarts, read, read the box. It's, it's crazy. There's directions, first of all. That's a, do I need directions for a Pop-Tart? Anyhow, there's directions. And it says, take it out of the packet and put it in the toaster, right? And it takes like two or three minutes and you got your Pop-Tart and you're on your way to work or school. But there's actually two different directions. One for the toaster, the second one for the microwave. Read it next time. Take it out of the pouch, put it on high in the microwave. I just looked on the internet last night for three seconds. Three seconds. I, I was just thinking, like, who doesn't have time in their schedule to wait three minutes in the toaster? I got to have it right now. Like, I need it in three seconds. That's the culture that we live in. And so most young people growing up in this instant culture, see, when I was in junior high, high school, if you thought somebody was cute, you'd have to put your swag on a little bit. You'd have, to, you'd have to write like a little letter. You had to tell your friend to tell his friend to tell her friend to tell the friend the friend. How I many you know you had to work at it? You had to dress nice and you had to bring flowers. You had to write a letter. Now, you, if you just think somebody's cute, you DM them on Instagram. You can have an instant boyfriend right now. It doesn't take any time. And we grew up in this culture, everything is now, and we forget about tomorrow. So I came to church today to let you know tomorrow is incredibly important. Important. And so to get, like, today is important, but I, I think I want to help you today get your focus off of today and let's focus on what? Tomorrow. And I think Psalm 112 is going to help us do that. So would you look at your Bible there and look, beginning at verse 1, I'm going to read down through verse 6 out of God's anointed version, the NIV. <laughs> Blessed are those who fear the Lord, who find great delight in his commands. The children will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be Blessed, wealth and riches are in their houses, and their righteousness endures forever. Even in darkness, light dawns for the upright, for those who are gracious and compassionate and righteous. Verse 5, good will come to those, good will come. New Living says, success comes. Let me just stop there. How many want to live a successful life? They're looking at their Bible. They're not raising their hand, though, so don't pick on them. What's the alternate? If you don't want to live a successful life, then you're going to live a unsuccessful life. So we want to live a successful life, right? That's probably why we're here at church today. So here it is. Good or success, according to verse 5, will come to those who are? Here it is. This is the, the recipe for a successful life. It comes to those who are generous and those that lend freely, who conduct their affairs with justice. And if we pursue that, verse 6 says, surely the righteous will never be Shaken. Look at me. Look at me. It doesn't say that we're never going to have shaking. I mean, there's always going to be shaking relationally, shaking financially, shaking uh, emotionally. It doesn't say that we're not going to have shaking, but we will never be shaken. Isn't that good? That, that God says, hey, I got you. If you build your foundation upon generosity and, and good stewardship, I've got you. You might have a little shaking, but you will not be shaken. Now check this out, verse 6. Surely the righteous will never be shaken. They will be remembered forevermore. The word is legacy. Here's what I'm going after. Look into my eyes. I'm going after 
when I die, I'm not sure if I have another day on the planet or another 25 or 30 years, but when I die, I want to leave a legacy for my kids, for my grandkids, and my great-grandkids. And my kids need to get going right now. None of them are married, but uh, we're, we're going after the mar- then the kids and then the grandkids. Here's what I want for my kids and grandkids and great-grandkids. Not just that, that, that I would give them a financial inheritance, more importantly, a spiritual one. What would it be awesome for Steve Abraham and Tammy Abraham to look and all three kids are serving the Lord and their kids are serving the Lord and their kids are serving the Lord and a whole lineage of Abraham say, hey, these are fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. And if I live a life of uh, generosity, Verse 6 says, check it out, they will be remembered forevermore. You will be remembered forevermore. I will be remembered forevermore because I've left a godly legacy. That's what I'm going after. So check it out. My job as your pastor is to prepare you for tomorrow. So the two-question test, ready on your notes here, two-question test. Do you know there's a test coming, by the way? I hate tests. I've told you I was never a really good student at all in junior high, high school. I got a little better in Bible college because I was excited about what I was studying, but I was really bad in school. Anybody else? Let me see your hand. Come on, don't leave me hanging on the stage. God bless you and you. Come on, raise your hand. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Don't leave me up here by myself. Thank you, thank you. And here, like, I, I could read a whole chapter because I'm going to get tested on it the next day. I got it. I think I got it. And then I get to the test the next day and I can't remember anything. You know what I'm talking about? I couldn't retain anything. I have told you, and I'll, I'll say it again, I am very proud to let you know, I graduated in the top 5% of the bottom 2% of my class. <laughs> but I, I realized early on, I just wasn't a good test taker. And I had a f- friends that, like, they didn't even study. They didn't even read an A, A, A. And even the times where I felt like I studied and I was prepared and I told my friend, I killed that one. How'd you do? Aced it. Get it back. D. <laughs> I know. Sad, isn't it? And you know, there are actually two tests coming, not just for the people in this room, but the people outside of this room. Every person on planet Earth, there are two tests coming. And because I'm a pastor that loves you, I want to prepare you for the test. Are you ready? Romans 14, verse 10 through 12 says, you then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand, notice all, not some, not most, not a few, all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge me. So then each of us, or all of us, will give an account of ourselves to God. Do you know most Christians don't even know that there's two tests? So I'm going to prepare you for the test. Here we go, test number one. Test number one, here's the question, what did you do with Jesus? That's the first question that will be asked. How many of us are going to heaven or going to face eternity? How many of us are going to stand before God? All of us. And all of us will get asked this question, what did you do with my son Jesus Christ? God's going to say, look at me, God is going to say, 2,000 years ago I sent my son to die for the penalty of your sin. What did you do with him? Because how many know that sin has to be penalized? And either you pay for it or he pays for it. So what did you do with my son, Jesus Christ? This is a powerful verse, Revelation 20, 11 and 12 says, then I saw a great white throne. Don't fall asleep, you gotta pay attention. And him who was seated on it, the earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, notice this, I saw the dead great and popular and unpopular, rich and poor, celebrities and nobodies, black and white, Hispanic and Asian, everybody was there. Standing before the throne, and notice this, and books, plural, were opened, and another book, singular, was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, according that was recorded in the books, plural. Look right into my eyes. This is really important. Ready for a theology lesson? According to Revelation, there are books in heaven, in eternity. Everything that you ever thought that was evil and wicked is recorded in those books. Think about this. What happens if right now everything that you thought and did in the last 30 days came up on the screen for everybody to see? How many of you be like, oh! Okay, so there's books in heaven. Every time you cuss somebody out, every time somebody cut you off on the freeway and you flipped them off, every time you went off on your spouse, you were disrespectful, you were disobedient. Everything that was ever done from the day we were born up until eternity is recorded in the books. 
Come on, that should frighten all of us. But, but, in fact, when I get to heaven one day, they're going to be like, uh, name please, uh, Steve, Abraham, A, start with an A, A, A B, and they're going to be looking over all the books. I can't, can't, can't find anything. And here's the reason they can't find anything, because in 1985, there's another book, the book of life. So everything that happened in my life up until 1985, those were found in the books. But in 1985, there's only one name in one book called the book of life. And I want to ask you a question. Are you in the book of life? God wants to know, 2,000 years ago, I sent my only son to die in your place. Let me ask you a question. How many of you know that you know that you know that you're married? How do you know? How do you know? How do you know? Duh. How do I know? That's ridiculous. Because me and my husband, me and my wife went to a church and there was a pastor there and we invited our friends and we invited our family. We got a certificate. We got our rings to prove it. How many graduated high school? No shame if you didn't, but how do you know? So stupid. Yeah, I, I graduated Westlake High School in 1983. I can tell you we had a ceremony inside of the gymnasium. I was there. And if you're that sure about a physical relationship, if you're that sure about a marriage, do you have kids? Yeah, they're sitting right next to me. Are you sure? That's a dumb question. Shouldn't you be that much sure about a spiritual decision that sometimes, like, you should be able to look back a week ago, a month, sometime for me, it was 1985. This was the day I said yes to Jesus Christ. So everybody in the room, everybody outside of the room will stand before God and he's going to say, what did you do with my son? So there's either going to be books of all the things you did or your name is written in the one book and the one book snuffs out all of the other books. Isn't that good news? Well, how do you get into the book of life? Well, Jesus said this in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, not everyone who says, not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father. Many will say, not, not, not some, not a few, not a couple. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, notice this. Didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we drive out demons in your name and per perform many miracles? Then I, think about this. There are actually people that are going to get to heaven that casted demons out of people. God's going to be like, I know, but I didn't know you. Gave a prophetic word. Hey, I believe that the Lord's saying this. By Wednesday, you're going to get a job, and you get the job by Wednesday. Prophetic word comes through. Wow. It's going to pray for somebody that's crippled or lame or deaf and pr might pray for them and they get healed. And he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. Could it be possible in our church that many will come to him on that day and say, we went to, we went to forest service. I was on the worship team. I went to youth group on Wednesday night. I gave some money. I was an usher. I worked in the tech booth. And he's going to say, depart from me, I never. See, it's not about what you say. It's not, listen, it's not head knowledge. I believe there's a God out there. It's, I've given my heart to Jesus Christ. So that's the first question. I want to prepare you for that question. It's coming. It might not come today or this week, but we will all stand before Christ. What will you say? I love you too much to tell you that if you just believe that there's a God out there, that you're going to heaven. You got to know him personally. Number two. Number two, what did, here's the second question, and most Christians don't know this either. Second question you're going to get asked is, what did you do with what I gave you? Write that down. What did you do with what I, what I what? Notice he never asked the question. He, he doesn't ask us to give what we don't have. But 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due for us. Uh, do us for the things that will be done in my body, whether good or bad. And it's not just talking about money. It's talking about my time, my talents, my gifts, my energy, my prayers, my ideas, my encouragement, my, my affirmation, my forgiveness. It's everything. Matthew 16, 27, the Son of Man will come with his angels in the glory of his Father and will judge all people according to their deeds. So because I love you, I want to tell you the answer to the question. The question is, what did you do with what I have? The answer should be something like this. God, to the best of my ability, I gave everything to you. We sing so many worship songs. Think about it. I surrender all, all to you. Like, here's, do you really surrender everything to him? Is it just like a song that we sing that's kind of awesome? Or are we willing? And not, nothing wrong with having stuff, right? But we got to make sure that stuff doesn't have us. So how many know that the Bible says, to whom much is given, much is what? Required. 
So for my life and my wife and my family and our church, I mean, God's given us a lot. We are, everybody in the room, you are filthy rich. You're like, you have no idea. I mean, I work at Chick-fil-A, I make like minimum wage. You are, according to world standards, you're filthy rich. If you live in America, you're rich. If you live in uh, Southern California, you are very rich. If you live in Ventura County, you are filthy rich. You're like, ah, that's so cute. No, no, true. Most people don't have electricity. Most people across the globe don't have running water. Most people don't have a job that makes $13, $15, $18 an hour. Most people aren't driving an automobile or two or three. Most people don't have internet. Most people don't have air conditioning in their car. I'm just comparing you to the rest of the world. I'm comparing me to the rest of the world. We're rich and do much is given, much is what? Much is required. And we're going to stand before God. He said, what, what did you do with the time I gave you? What did you do with the gifts I gave you? What did you do with the finances I gave you? So here, here it is. I want to break that down. Uh, three, three things under this, how to live with tomorrow in mind. Because I, I just realized a lot of Christians just live, they wake up and they don't have purpose. They don't live intentionally. They live haphazardly or, or incidentally or inadvertently. And I, wanna, I want you to wake up every day with purpose, knowing why you're here and what you're to be about. Intentional is the word that I'm thinking. Ready? Here's three things. Number one. Let me give you three things. First thing is this, I will intentionally give what I have. I'll intentionally give what I have. Again, let me say it. He doesn't ask us to give what we don't have, but I intentionally give what I do have. I read a stat this week, listen, 76% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. Now, let me just, there is no condemnation in the room. I know some of you might have just lost a job in the last couple of weeks, no condemnation. Some of you, you just you went through a divorce. Some of you had three or four kids, and just to pay the bills, you're just trying to get by. No condemnation. But I'm talking to the rest of us. 76% live paycheck to paycheck. Here's the problem. God says, I want you to be able to, Steve, give unto every good work. Question, how can I give into every good work if I'm living my life paycheck to paycheck? The problem why I can't give into every good work is because I'm living above my means. And so I can't give into every good work. So even, I'm not trying to brag, but even this week, uh, my wife was going through Facebook and she said, hey, if you give to a nonprofit organization today, they'll match the gift. I said, let's give 100 to them, let's give 100 to them, and let's give 50 to there. If I didn't have 250 to give in a second, I wouldn't be able to give unto every good work. So God says, Steve, I want you to give not just your money, your time, your talent, your treasure, your energy, your affirmation, your, your, your forgiveness. I want you to give everything back to me. And I want to share this illustration, and I, I don't want you to walk out and say, oh, he's incredible. Here's what I, I just want you to hear a principle. So a couple months ago, uh, I've shared a little bit. I have a BMW motorcycle, and I was thinking about getting rid of my motorcycle, and I thought, well, I'm going to sell it, and it was worth good chunk of change. And then I really felt like the Lord said, I want you to give it to somebody. And when he said, I want you to give it away, I was like, give it away? And he's like, yeah, give it away. I'm like, you sure? And he's like, yep. And not only did I know I was supposed to give it away, I knew who I was supposed to give it to. Here's the, here's the thing. So I was going to get my motorcycle free BMW. I was going to give it away. The thing was it needed a brand new back tire. In fact, somebody on the staff said, hey, your back tire has like a crack in it. It's going to blow any second. And then the seat was all ripped. Okay, so I'm going to give it away. So I'm sitting back there at that chair on a Wednesday night service, and Kenan's husband, Josh, was preaching about generosity. Oh, I just be generous. And I'm back there, and I heard the Lord say, not an audible voice, but I heard the Lord say, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pay for the back tire, and I want you to fix the seat, then give it away. So I was back there, and I was like, say it again. He's like, yeah, you pay for it. I was like, you pay for it. But so I did. The next day I went and got a tire. It cost me like 300 and something dollars. Paid for the seat to get fixed. And a couple, about a week or so later, I can't even tell you how excited I was. Like I, I was just like waking up. Because they were moving from one place to another. And the, the old place didn't have a garage to store it. So I had to wait. So I was like a week or two I had to wait. And then finally the day came. He said, let's sit down. Because they thought I was going to talk about like a price thing. And let's negotiate. And I said, no. And they walked in. I was just like, I'm so excited. And I had a little contract in there, and I said, hey, uh, number one, one thing is if you crash this thing, I'm going to punch you in the throat, so don't crash it. And you have to get rid of it. You have to take a, a class. And, and I said, also, you have to give away. I said, in the, in the next 30 days, you have to give away some, some money. 
It wasn't as much as the bike, but I'm saying, hey, I'm giving to you. You're going to give back. And they signed it. I'll tell you, man, it was just like, ah! they thought we were going to negotiate a price. And I'm like, no, there you go. It's yours. Please don't clap. It's just a, it's just something God put on my heart. It's the way I want to live my life. But listen, if I, if I owed like $8,000 on the bike and, I, and God said to you know, give it away, I couldn't afford to do it. But because I was willing to give unto every good work, that, I want to live my life that way, not just with my money. Yes. On the front row, we introduced Andy Ortega. This is honestly one of the most generous people on the planet. You want to hang out with him because he'll give you stuff, I promise you, and it's just awesome. <laughs> I wish I had a half an hour right now to just, in 2018, all the things that God's done in our life, from people working on our house and saying, hey, it should cost this, but we're going to do this. Gift cards, take you out to lunch, this, we're going to fix your car for free. I just go on and on and on. This, this guy, we went to Spain a couple uh, months ago. He upgraded my wife and I, or my, my daughter and I to business class international. Yeah. I was like, hallelujah. <laughs> Business class international is way better than first class domestic. Let me just tell you that. We're just like, what's up? We're all laying down. It was awesome. I'm going to live my life that way with my money, with my time, with my energy, with my affirmation. And God wants to know, are you willing to give everything to him? Can he trust you with it? I just want, I want to, I want to release our church and empower our church with a spirit of generosity. What could God do in our city, and our county, if we just said, hey, this isn't mine. Yeah, I want to bless. I'm taking you out the line. In fact, this would be cool right after the service. Go to the cafe and just buy somebody in line. Just say, I'm buying your coffee. What? Yeah, I'm buying your coffee. Take somebody to lunch today. Just, man, just bless Sam, I'm taking you to lunch. Anybody have arms? Give, seriously, give somebody a big hug and just say, man, I really appreciate you. Thank the ushers, thank the teachers in there, thank our volunteers, thank one another. You have fingers? Why don't you text somebody today? Text your parents, text your kids, te text your coworker, text your boss and just say, hey, I just was thinking about you. You're just an awesome person. Th just giving generosity away, giving kindness away. And I just empower us as a church. I mean, we can turn our city right side up if we will release a spirit of generosity. When you go to the restaurant today, give a generous tip. You get 10%. What are you talking about? I don't give you any more than I give God. I'll give him a generous tip. Well, they weren't really that great. Do it anyhow. Some of you are amazing cooks. Make a killer meal, unbelievable meal, and drop it off at my house tonight. <laughs> write down this address. Here we go. Two, no, just kidding. Just, just live a life of generosity. Here's the second thing. Write the second thing down. If tomorrow really matters, number two, I need to be committed to the second thing. I will s intentionally serve other people. I will intentionally serve. I'm not going to have you raise your hand if you've been going to our church for three or four months or less, but I do want to talk to you. Anybody going to the church less than three months, I just want to talk to you. You have, our permi you have my permission just to come every single Sunday. You can sing some songs, and when the buckets go by, you don't give anything. You don't have to get involved in ministry. You don't have to do anything. You just come, sit, soak, sour, and do nada. Got it? After three or four months... It's time to get out of the stands, and it's time to get into the game. Jesus said, if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you need to be the servant of all. So I would just say, serve somewhere here, greeter, usher, children's ministry, worship. Do you know, we have, we have, I bet you there's probably 10 to 15 people in our church that play an instrument, but for whatever reason, you buried your gift. It's time to resurrect the gift, okay, and start using it. Some of you young people are so good in tech, cameras and switchers and social media. I release you to use your gift for the kingdom of God. Here's the myth in a big church like ours. You walk in, you're like, ah, oh, they got it. They don't need our help. I'm telling you, we need your help. Four services and more. We have 500 faithful volunteers, but we don't need 500. We need like 2,000 to do what God's called us to do. So I release you for three or four months. Just chill. Someone say chill. But after that, it's time to get into the game. By the way, I happened to, that's just a coincidence. Wow. I got a Connect card up here. It wasn't a coincidence. On the back of the Connect card, some of you never look at it, there's places that you can serve. Here, please listen carefully. Because we get these and like, every, they check every box. That tells us you don't want to serve anywhere. Okay. And some of you don't like kids, so we don't want you in the children's ministry. Okay. But we want you to pray about it. Let's say you start helping with kids and you realize you don't like kids, then we'll shift you to somewhere else. Greeter, usher, tech booth, there's so many different places. Second Saturday comes every single month. We just need more people to go into the community to love people unconditionally with no strings attached. And there's so many different ways and 
if you write something down, we're going to call you. Listen carefully. So if you're writing something down, we're going to call. So you want to sign up? Don't say, oh, no, I was just kidding. <laughs> we would say don't sign it unless you're serious, okay? And all the staff said amen to that. You know? So I will intentionally serve others. Number three, I will intentionally share Jesus. Key word is intentional. The Bible says that we are all ambassadors of Christ. What's an ambassador? Somebody that lives, is from one country, from the United States, moves to Italy, lives in Italy, but represents the interests of the United States. How many know that we don't live here, if you're a Christian? We live in heaven. We're just, right, citizens and sojourners of the earth, but we are sent as ambassadors from heaven to this earth, whether it's 10 years or 50 years or 80 years, and the reason why we're ambassadors to share the good news of Jesus Christ. I was thinking this week, how many believe we have, like, the most amazing news on the planet? Yeah. I mean, we... The good news of Jesus Christ is you don't have to die in your sins. There's a home for you in heaven, and there's a remedy and a cure for your wickedness, right? We have the answer. It's called the good news. The gospel actually means good news. So I was thinking about the good news. Now think about this. This is a very important message. God's like, how are we going to get the good news to the world? I was thinking about a, different, a couple of different ways that I think would be more effective than the way he chose. How about this? This would be awesome. Right after the service, you walk outside, and you actually see the finger of God from heaven. He's writing in the sky. You are all sinners. Repent in the name of Jesus, and you'll have eternal life. P.S. Sign God. How many think God can do that if he wanted to? But it's probably not going to happen that way. You might just see an airplane with some whatever. Okay. How many know if he wanted to? Because every time in the New Testament you read about angels, any time anybody had an encounter with an angel, they were greatly afraid. How about this, like tomorrow at 3 a.m., everybody on the planet gets woken up by an angel that's like nine feet tall. And he just like shakes them and they wake up, he's like, repent! I mean, that would scare the heaven into them. Right? He could do that if he wanted to, but he didn't do that. He could, I think this would be cool, on the way to work or school tomorrow, kids just go to like Pacific High, he's like, what's up, dog? And then he just drops Bibles out of heaven, but not the soft, the, the hard ones, like boom! And the kid kind of falls down and then... He, he falls down on the floor, and right in front of him is John 3, 16. And it's highlighted. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. He could, I know he could do that if he wanted to, but he didn't choose to do that. Here's the method that he chose. I would not have done that. I would not trust you. I'm sorry. But he did. He chose us. The method to get the good news of Jesus into the world is you and I. So we say this at Training for Life Level 1. My wife and I always talk about this. Everybody in the room, everyone, if you're a Christian, you are a full-time minister. So God, you might be a banker or a baker or a candlestick maker. You might be in construction. You might be a nurse. You might be a doctor. You might be a teacher. You might work at a cubicle or an office. But God spins you into those fields as an ambassador from heaven sent to people that need to hear about the love of Jesus Christ. And I want to ask you a very challenging thing. When is the last time you shared your faith boldly with someone. When's the last time you invited somebody to come to a church? Yeah, but I, I don't know. They, they ask all these hard questions, and I don't know what to say. Pastor Steve, can you come into my work tomorrow? And No, no. All you need to say is this. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know all the answers. But listen, I used to be an addict. I used to be really lonely. I used to be depressed. I had a child out of wedlock, and I was, I was so devastated. And, and then... I encountered Jesus Christ, and God set me free, and, and here's how my life has changed since I came to Christ. That's all you need to say, what your life was like before Christ, how your life got converted to Christ, and how you are different as a result of following Christ. How I many know oh, they can't argue your testimony? What are they going to say? That didn't really happen. Share Jesus Christ boldly. Check out this verse, Luke 14, 23. Then the master told his servant, go out into the roads and county lanes and compel them to come in so that my house may be... God wants his house full. I want to be honest. My wife and I went to the movies on Friday. And I was hoping that nobody was sitting near me, next to me. I, I want my space. Yeah, amen. So we got, we got our popcorn there with extra butter. Don't judge me. And so that's right there. And, and I got my hands right here. And I got my territory. And this is so sad. But 
right? And the movie's about to start. You see people like coming in the left, so my peripheral, and I, I'm like, please, please keep going, keep going. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> the next one, I keep, no, 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 no. So the movie's just about to start, and we got the whole road to ourselves. It's like, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Not all those little suckers that come at the last second. So this couple, the whole row, the whole row, they come and they sit. And I'm like, oh, yeah, God bless. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Dios le bendiga. <laughs> and on the inside, it's just like, Ugh. so I'm like, move my popcorn, move my stuff. And I, I went from this to like this. And I was like praying them out of there. And sure enough, like a minute later, they're like, oh, I'm sorry, we're sitting in the wrong seat. I'm like, I was like, oh, we had a great relationship. No, I so I, I want my row, I want my space. I want my row to myself, but if I go to a restaurant after, the, I don't want to wait 20 minutes to get seated. I want an empty restaurant, an empty, God wants his house full. I got to say this a lot. Our staff doesn't sit around saying, hey, we have four services. We're not busy enough. What else can we do? Let's start another service. Doing four services, I lost my voice in the first service. It's not convenient to have four services, but Jesus said, I want my house full. So if I have to get laryngitis, if I have to add two more services, I have to preach Friday night, Saturday night, five on Sunday, we're going to do what it takes. Because we don't do church because it's convenient. We do church because Jesus wants his house full, full. Hey, full is inconvenient. But God says, I want my house full. So go into the highways and the byways, go to your campus, go to your work, go to your school, go to your neighborhood and compel people to come in. I gotta, hey, if you just invite somebody to come to a Sunday morning, invite somebody to come to a Friday night women's thing, just say, hey, I'm paying your way. And they come and they're going to encounter the power of Jesus Christ. Hey, it's you planting some seeds. We trying to provide a service of excellence and you plant and we plant and some people come along and water. God's the one that saves people, but he wants his house full. I've read the book of Acts so many times. I did a whole series on this, I think in 2008. I've never seen this verse and it is so powerful. Please don't fall asleep. I want you to sit up straight and check this verse out. It is so awesome. So Paul left the synagogue and took the believers with them. Then they held daily discussions at the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This continued for how long? How long? So that, so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Wow. So you didn't even catch it. So you're like, where are we going, in and out or toppers? You weren't paying attention, because if you were paying attention, you'd be like, wow. So let me tell you what that means. Think about this. So for two years, Paul got together, basically did Bible studies. And after two years, the word spread to every person in Asia. I didn't say every person in Ventura County. I didn't say every person in California. I didn't even say every person in the United States. Every, have you ever been to Asia? I've been to Asia. It's a big continent. I got a question for you. How in the world did the word of God get out in less than two years to every single resident on an entire continent? Because Billy Graham wasn't alive 2,000 years ago. They didn't have the internet 2,000 years ago. They didn't do mass revivals 2,000 years ago. How did it happen? Fired up, fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ that were passionate about sharing their faith, shared their faith at their school, at their house, at their neighborhood. It went from neighborhood to neighborhood to neighborhood, from workplace to workplace to workplace. And in less than two years, the word of God went to every place. And if they can do that for an entire continent, we can do that for our county. But it's gonna, I'll tell you, it's gonna take all of us. Not some of us, it's gonna take what? So turn to somebody and say, he's talking to you. He's talking to you. It's gonna take all of us. So check it out, here's a $64,000 question. Why should I live this way? Giving, serving, <clears throat> sharing. Why should I live this way? Here's the answer, ready? There is more to this life than this life. Why should I give radically? Why should I serve faithfully? Why should I share my faith boldly? Because there's more to this life than this life. And God's gonna ask me, Steve, what did you do with the time I gave you, the gifts I gave you, the money I gave you? Again, I'm telling everybody in the room, you are incredibly rich. And I have to say this all the time. When you talk about money, it's not what God wants from you. He doesn't need anything. It's what he wants for you. He wants to bless you. And he's looking for a congregation. He's looking for families. He's looking for individuals to say, hey, 
Who can I trust? It's not about giving so I can get stuff back. No, then God says, okay, I can trust. And then keep giving it away. Keep giving. And it's a blast. It's fun to live this way. But not just with your finances, with your time, with your forgiveness. And I'm just, I just really want us to live a radical, committed life in Jesus. So let me just get real practical. First thing is we talk just about giving financially. I would hope that everybody that calls New Life your home, if you've been going here for at least three or four months, I would hope it's my prayer that you would just do what the Bible says, that you would tithe 10% of your income. It's just, honestly, it's like, it's kindergarten Christianity. It's just like basic giving. And here's what I want to do. If you've never got on board of tithing, we would never, by the way, have to have a building campaign. We would never have to do anything if 4,000 people in our church just did what the Bible said. You're like, I don't know, it's kind of scary. And 10%, that seems like a lot. And, and maybe it is. And it's a stretch and you got to release your faith and you got to trust God. So I would just ask if you're not doing it, how about this? Take a 90-day tithe challenge. Just to say, for the next three months, I'm going to do it. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it. If I have to live a little below my means, I'm going to make that happen. But I, I'm going to do what God tells me to do. By the way, God's never going to tell you to do something that's humanly impossible. I mean, it, maybe it looks humanly impossible, but God's going to come alongside and he's going to bless. I, not, give God 90 days. Because he says in Malachi chapter 3, test me in this. So let's do it. <laughs> say, okay, God, 90 days. We're going to, 10% it goes back to the local church. So I wanted to say that. The second thing I want to say is on two weeks from today, we're going to receive, this is on top of your regular tithe, we're going to receive a one-time special offering that's going to sow a seed into 2019. I can't even tell you some of the things that we got planned for 2019, but all this year, the hundreds of people that came to Life in Christ, that got baptized, the cafe that we built, the outreach that we've done, and we have way more in store, and we've got ideas about how to use the money in 2019. So I, I just did some math in my office really quickly before I got up here. If 3,000 people gave $100, how much money is that? $300,000. Some of you can't afford to do 100, that's great. Give 10, give five, go, junior high, give 10 cents. Have a garage sale. You'd be amazed. Go through your garage and say, what a, have a garage, you probably get two or $300. And it, and it goes to sow a seed for the vision that God's given us in 2019. And notice, I, we didn't talk about generosity. And it was like, okay, now we're going to take an offering. We're going to pressure. No, no sad faces and no sad stories. Just we want you to go home and pray, talk to your family. But make it a sacrifice. I'll just be honest. For, for me and my wife, to give $100 would not be a sacrifice to us. So we're going to give a sacrificial gift. You need to know this, that our church staff is not doing something that we're not already. We're not asking you to do something we're not doing. We're leading the way in this but to, to live this way so we can fulfill the dreams and the vision that God has for us. That's in two weeks. We'll talk more about that next week. We're gonna see a really cool video that sums up 2018. So I want you to be prepared for that in two weeks. Pray, if you're a single person, pray. If you're a family, get together and pray and say, God, what do you want us to do? We're gonna step out of our comfort zone and by faith, we're gonna just ask God to release finances over our church. Before I pray, I feel very led to do this. I, it would be negligent for me to talk about the fact that there's coming a day soon that we're all gonna stand before God to give an account for our life. And he's gonna say, what did you do with my son, Jesus? I sent him to die in your place. I sent him to pay the penalty of your sin. And most of the people in this room have already believed and confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But listen, some of you have been going to the church for a long time and notice Jesus said, just because you say to me, again, it's not a head thing, it's a, I've given my heart to God. God, you have everything, you're, you're everything to me. If you ask me to give my house, I'll give it away. I'll do whatever you ask me to do, God. Does God have your heart? Is he number one in your life? So I'm gonna give you an opportunity to respond to the love of God with your heads bowed and your eyes closed just all over this room right now. I'm just gonna invite those that are already Christians to pray right now. I really believe this, I, I say it a lot, but I believe that eternity is on the line for some people. God's knocking on the door of your heart. I wanna start this way on the left side of the building, which is my right. If you're not sure if you're a Christian and you wanna make sure, 
I would love to pray for you. It'd be my honor and privilege to pray for you today. That before you walk out of this building, not trying to scare anybody, but accidents happen, car accidents happen. Medical issues arise. We're just not sure. We're not guaranteed today. Bible says our life is like a vapor. Here one second, gone the next. But do you know that you know that you know that you're a Christian? If you're not sure, I would love to pray for you. And I want you to do a couple things right now. Everybody's got their heads bowed and their eyes closed. Would you open up your eyes? Would you lift your head up? And would you lift your hand as high as you can? And would you look at me? I just want to agree with anybody in this section. I agree with you. And I agree with you too. Thank you. And I agree with you and you as well. Thanks, man. All the way in the back, I see your hand with the hat on. I agree with you in Jesus' name. Anybody else here? Off to my right, the far left, I see your hand. Thank you, sweetheart. I see your hand as well. Amen. On the front row, I see you. Thank you for lifting your hand. Anybody here in the middle section? Let's go ahead and lift up your hand. Just look at me, would you? Nothing to be ashamed of. I agree with you and 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 you. Anybody else? I agree with you in Jesus' name. All the way in the back, I see your hand. And I see your hand. Thank you. And I see you, man. Thanks for lifting your hand. Anybody else here in the middle section? And off to my left, the far right side. Anybody in this section right over? I agree with you, ma'am. Go ahead and look at me. I agree with you in Jesus' name. One, two, three, four, five in that section. I agree with you. Thanks, ma'am, for lifting your hand. Sir, I see you. I see your hand. I see both of you ladies right there. I see you. And the two of you, I see you as well in Jesus' name. Praise God. God wants his house full. Everybody in the room, would you repeat this prayer after me? Father in heaven, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. And today, December 2nd, 2018, I turn from my sin, I turn from my ways, and I embrace Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Come into my heart. I declare I love you, and I will follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, come on, can we stand to our feet? Let's put our hands together. Praise God. I want to invite those that are part of our prayer team, if you would come forward right now. If you would move quickly, anybody on our staff, make yourself available. Just real quickly. We're going to sing a song in just a second. Those that are part of our prayer team, if you would come right now. This is so amazing. Please, can I get your attention? Don't check out right now. There was probably about 25 or 30 people that lifted up your hand. And we celebrate the decision that you made. I want to invite you, as we start singing this song, I want to invite you to come down and find one of these people and just say, hey, today I raised my hand and I invited Christ in my life and I want to pray for you and get you started. And if you're like, well, it's kind of scary, invite somebody to come with you, a family member, a friend. And we just want to, we want to start you in your next steps with Jesus Christ. So when you lifted your hand, you said, I want to follow the Lord. We want to help you in that next step. So I'm going to invite you right when the worship team starts singing, get out of your seat, come forward, let somebody pray with you. If you're not coming forward about that, but you need prayer, feel free to come forward if you need prayer for anything. Would you lift your hands to the Lord right now? God, this is our heart. This is our pride. This is the declaration of our life. God, we give you all. We give you everything. We give you our finances. We give you our life. We give you our time. We give you our affection. We give you our affirmation. God, we give everything to you. We give it all because you gave it all. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said amen. Amen. My life is not my own.